Okay, good morning. Hola. If you would, open your Bibles um, to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. Okay, uh, we'll start at verse 7. It says, uh, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, um, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Uh, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Okay, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to, it, uh, to a, us word. Uh, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. Uh, the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for, the, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, Okay, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Um, well, we finish off the thought. It says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heaven and new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may, found, that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. So we are looking at the final in our series of Words in Context, and today is going to be Day of the Lord. Now, um, I, it should be Day of Christ, uh, not Christian. Day of Christian, is, uh, it auto-corrected me when I was typing it. I picked that up when I printed it out. But it should be Day of Christ, not, not Day of Christian. So I put it as far as our heading uh, subject, we're looking at Day of the Lord versus the Day of Christ. Um, the day of Christ is also going to be mentioned in Scripture, and we're getting ready to look at that in a bit. But the day of the Lord is something that a lot of people tend to kind of uh, not be familiar with. What, what's that even dealing with? Um, <coughs> we'll be looking at a few other passages, but primarily here as far as in the New Testament where it's mentioned is here in 2 Peter. Now, the day of the Lord is mentioned as being something that is still yet pending, that is coming, that we should be looking forward to. And it says in particular that it's going to be a day, uh, verse 10, that it's going to come as a thief in a night, and then in which the heavens, or basically the, not just heaven, where God lives, but as far as up in the heavens, um, the, like the sky and the atmosphere and such, they're going to be, they're going to melt away, um, excuse me, they'll pass away with a great noise and then the elements shall melt uh, with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Okay, so this is going to be something that's very unique and distinctive. Uh, we see this referenced in Revelation. We also see this mentioned a number of times in Old Testament. In particular, there's 18 references to the day of the Lord. Uh, well, 19 according to what I put here, but two of them are going to be in the same passage. But you're going to have roughly about 18, 19 pa uh, mention of day of the Lord itself. Now you have also another term that's used in conjunction called that day or that great and terrible day. And that's used uh, 208 times. The only thing with that though is that there are times, certain contexts in which that day is referencing to not just the, the, the great and terrible day or the day of the Lord, but rather it's referencing, okay, in that day this transpired. So when I was doing my search on that, it, you'd have to pick out as far as like, okay, uh, if you were to do, um, what, 
if you all have Bible works, you can just go on Bible works and just put a, um, on the command line, you know, dot that day, and then you'd have all the instances in which that's used, but it doesn't differentiate as far as which one is referencing the day of the Lord, as opposed to just, okay, that was a specific instance uh, of which it was used. Okay, so we have 18, or 19 rather, that are used. Now the day itself, uh, the term defined here, we have uh, day of the Lord, or rather Jehovah's Day. Um, interesting. Of the instances in which it's used in the New Testament, here being one of them, uh, from the Old Testament, it's literally the day of Jehovah, right? The, the day of Yahweh. But in the New Testament, you only have uh, one word for Lord, uh, which would be curios. So whenever you have a translation, or not a translation, but rather when you have a referencing of Old Testament passages where you have Lord as Jehovah being mentioned, in the New Testament, <coughs> excuse me, there's no way to indicate as far as to whether or not that was actually Jehovah that they're referencing or if it was just um, the other term that's used in, in uh, Old Testament as Adonai. Uh, except outside of just context. Kai, good morning, Maria. We are in Second uh, Peter. Second Peter, chapter three. Uh, do we have any more outlines? On there? One. We're looking at uh, Day of the Lord, uh, and then also it should be Day of Christ as opposed to Day of Christian. I didn't catch that whenever I typed, whenever I printed it, that it auto-corrected me because it had it marked, but it, I, I didn't think it was going to automatically just do it for correct. me. But it should be Day of Christ. Okay, so the mentions of, well, okay, we look at, okay, according to the outline, Day of the Lord is literally Jehovah's Day. And then the words used, okay, day would be this the word yom. Or if when the New Testament mentions of it, it's going to be the day, uh, or the word hera for day. Okay, which literally just means a, a day, a day, uh, 20, a little 24 hour period. But also it could mean, um, has a connotation of the fact of a time period. The day of Christ is literally just Christ's day. Okay, now, in the instances in which we find it used, uh, you find Day of the Lord more often used than you find Day of Christ. Day of Christ is referenced only simply in the New Testament, uh, and that is specifically uh, mentioned or addressing uh, believers or the Christians. Okay, so um, Day of the Lord in particular uh, we were reading through in Second Peter 3. We started verse 7, and then we worked all the way through uh, verse 14. But verse 10, it mentions specific things about the day of the Lord. It says in verse 10 that uh, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Okay, so that's the nature of, of it. And then that the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with a fervent heat. And then the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Okay, so this is something that's kind of different and unique. Um, and we'll see, we'll see the contrast as far as when we read the verses regarding the day of Christ. But this obviously is mentioning some pretty extraordinary events that are going to take place when you have the day of the Lord. And so this is Jehovah's Day. This is the day that God is going to judge. Now in the mention of it in other passages, primarily like in Zechariah, uh, you have that the day of the Lord is not just limited to one day, but rather it's because of the context is going to be referencing a time period. So we conclude that based on the fact that it's not just limited to just one instance or one day, or not just simply the day, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 3 that we're looking at, Second Peter 3, uh, that you would have 
that day of the Lord is not simply just the 24-hour period in which God says, okay, boom, earth, heavens, you're done, and then they're going to be melted away, they're going to be done away with, everything's going to be burnt up, and then you have uh, new heavens, new earth will be created after that. That would be conclusion. But rather, it's also addressing the fact that the great and terrible day, also synonymous with time of Jacob's trouble, which would be the time period in which you have Israel now in great tribulation. So in other words, you have Holy Spirit off the earth uh, as in as he is in us now. So the church is gone. Israel is allowed to go ahead and reinstate their sacrificial uh, worship system, which really isn't necessary um, because Christ has already done everything. And then you have Beyond that, um, the Antichrist rise up into power. He, um, before he actually reveals himself and, and calls for everybody to worship him, he's actually able to organize and uh, orchestrate to where you have Israel come into a peace treaty with basically all the nations of the world, because uh, all of them are basically, at this point, being controlled by Satan and then wanting to destroy Israel. And then so now he's able to go ahead and have a peace treaty with them. Uh, they're able to have now a one world system of government under which he's going to be basically ruler. And then halfway through the pact that he establishes with Israel, he's going to offer himself up in the actual temple that by this point is going to be rebuilt. And he is going to say, you know, I am God, worship me. And then you have basically the beginning of the actual judgment portions that we read about in Revelation where God starts opening up the seals, you get the vials that are get poured out, and then you have actually literal God himself pouring out his wrath upon the earth, upon the unbelievers, upon the nations uh, that would go against his people. Uh, three quarters of the earth is going to be basically just ruined. You're going to have probably more so by I'd say at least three quarters of the population on the earth are going to be destroyed, uh, they're going to be judged, <coughs> there are going to be many that are going to be born again in that time as well, God's going to have himself a witness uh, beyond just 144,000 uh, male Jewish virgin evangelists that are going to go out and preach the gospel, but also those that uh, would come to Christ, and many are going to be uh, of those martyred, beheaded, killed uh, for, the, for the name of Christ, for the cause of Christ, and then those up to leading up to whenever actually at the end of that seven year time frame, uh, when Christ, uh, because of his mercy, spares. Otherwise, no, no one, there should no flesh be spared. He is going to return, and he's going to return with us, uh, the church, and then the believers that are with him already in heaven. Uh, so the believers that would have preceded the establishing of the church, and then the believers that would be as part of the church that. Uh, were taken up uh, at the beginning por portion of that seven year period. So he's going to come down and then he's going to touch down Mount Olives and then he's going to establish his rule at that point. You're going to have a thousand year millennial reign. Anyway, so day of the Lord being not just limited to the fact of the day whenever he's going to destroy the whole earth, which we would see in Revelation uh, 20, 21 and then going into 22, as well as when he establishes new heaven, new earth, but also uh, that time period of whenever he's pouring out his wrath and his judgment. Um, now you have the day of Christ, or the day of Lord Jesus Christ. This is mentioned in particular by Paul. Uh, we'll look at a few instances and in when he mentions it. You see, Peter mentioned day of the Lord, but he doesn't mention day of Christ here. But he does mention day of the Lord, and then we see that he characterizes the day of the Lord as being the time when, okay, God's going to destroy the world. So it's a time of judgment. Turn to 1 Corinthians 8, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Right, the beginning of verse 4, it's actually verse 8 that we're going to look at, but verse 4 is uh, just to get the context of today. I thank my God always on your behalf 
the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so there's going to be a day mentioned here that is Christ Day in particular, and that it seems that we're going to stand, okay, or at least then in particular. He's, he's addressing, obviously, Corinthian believers, but by extension it's going to be us. So it's going to be a time period that he mentions that's specifically accounted as the day of Christ that they're supposed to be found blameless, or they want to be found blameless, or they should, you know, hopefully have a desire to want to be found blameless in standing before Christ. Uh, go to chapter 3, just a few pages over, chapter 3. Verse 8, okay, now he that planted and hath, and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Okay, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Uh, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is... Uh, Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, uh, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay, now, it doesn't mention that specific phrase, day of Christ or Christ's day, but it's mentioning this specific day uh, in which it's going to be declared what sort your work is or what labor that you've put in for the Lord is. Uh, and so the inference here is that this is a day in which what you've done for Christ is to be brought forth and it's to be measured or weighed, basically. And it's either going to be found wanting or it's going to be found something that's going to be valid before him. Okay, so that which, um, it's as if, what we do, our labor for the Lord, uh, and that is just simply anything that we do in obedience uh, by faith. Okay, uh, that's not limited to just uh, winning people to Christ or sharing the gospel, but uh, even as Christ said in the Gospels that uh, if, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, uh, you, you have done it to you know, you have done it to the least of these. Anything that you've done for the name of Christ. Uh, you garner reward. And yes. I got it really, I got it. So it can be ascertained that the day of Christ is an accounting for Christians, and the day of the Lord is a judgment of the lost. Yes. Is that basically right? Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't interrupt your train of thought there. No, 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 no. No. That's the contrast that basically I was trying to bring out okay. and show forth, because that's basically when you read the passages pertaining to the day of the Lord. It's always going to reference the fact that God's wrath is poured out. Uh, now we know a few things about God's character, and that He doesn't judge the righteous; He judges the wicked. Okay, so God's not looking to destroy. But then you also want to take this into account, and in that He says that the works are going to be judged. So, in a sense, you could say, okay, He's judging the righteous. Or even Peter says that uh, judgment must begin at the house of God, mm. right? But in other words, he's not pouring out his wrath on them. His wrath has been satisfied towards us because we believe on Christ. Does that make sense? So we don't have God's wrath coming down on us. We don't have uh, the full weight of his justice come down on us because that's already been done. That already came down on Christ. And so we receive Christ. Uh, what we do have, though, is the opportunity to be able to go ahead and live for him. And... That isn't, uh, that isn't something that's necessary. Here, let me define that. Let me explain that. 
it's necessary for us to live for Christ, but in other words, the opportunity that he affords us to live for him isn't necessary. He doesn't have to afford that to us. Does that make sense? Like, in other words, he doesn't have to allow us to live for him. Uh, he doesn't allow, he doesn't have to reward us, but that's his nature. That's how he is. That's who, that's, his, he's good. And so he affords us opportunity not only just to live for him, but he affords us opportunity to be able to gain reward. Um, you know, either as, as it says here, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. Um, in the Gospels also it speaks of that some will be rewarded, you know, tenfold, some thirtyfold, some hundredfold. Um, I believe also those are referencing the fact that there's opportunity beyond uh, that time period in which we're going to stand before Christ and then be rewarded either with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. Uh, that will be opportunity further on into not just what would be a thousand year reign, but even probably further than that. Um, we're not explicitly given a whole lot of detail with regard to eternity future, what God's going to do, other than he's going to have, you know, the rival, uh, crystal river flowing out from the throne of God after he created a new heaven and new earth, and then he's going to have the new Jerusalem, uh, that is going to be four square that's going to reach up into the heavens and you're going to have access directly to heaven after that's recreated as um, basically direct passage, passageway up and then you're going to have uh, beyond just the river that's flowing there there's uh, no seas so at least no salt water bodies or at least uh, no other water bodies beyond this that uh, we'll have obviously new bodies that we're going to be created with uh, but there's no, beyond those descriptions that we see in Revelation 22 in particular, I mean, part of 21, that we don't have any more detail given to us as far as, okay, what God has for us down the road. But given that we know his nature, we would infer, I would believe that he would have something similar to what we have now. And what I mean by that is a structure that we're, he's productive. Uh, God's industrious. He doesn't just you know, sit around and twiddle his thumbs and do nothing, but rather he's going to have something for us to do. He's always doing something. He's always at work at something. Uh, and then his original plan and his original creation, uh, had it not been barred by sin, would still be going on as far as you have the plants that were growing and producing fruit. You had Adam who was to reproduce uh, and then they would have kids, and then they would have obviously tasks that they would be given, and then they would have things that they would do. Uh, they would have something with which to occupy themselves, simply just not just hanging out. So I, I would say, okay, you have. Did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. Um, so okay, so we have here uh, in First Corinthians three. I'm sorry. The fact that is mentioned, we have gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, and then it's mentioned as that day. Uh, go to sec or five, First Corinthians five, First Corinthians five. Okay, uh, start at verse one just to give a context. Uh, we're going to look at verse five because that's where it's mentioned. It is reported commonly uh, that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, uh, for I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done so, uh, that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, you know, your glory is not going to be, uh, for know ye not that a little leaven leaven the whole lump. So it, it, he's uh, he's rebuking them now for the fact that they're allowing somebody that is in uh, gross sin, that is a known sin. Uh, continue on in there and, and not not addressing the not, not addressing the sin, not addressing the fact. Okay, you need to repent. Uh, and then he mentions here that they are supposed to give him up 
to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So in other words, he, this is uh, church discipline. Right? So he's addressing him regarding church discipline and the fact that they need to seek corrective measure to be able to go ahead and get him right to God. He doesn't want to take the admonishment as to, okay, repent. So fine, have it your way. Boom. You're given over to Satan. And then that way, you know, since you're already allowing his influence in your life, let's see how far that takes you, which your flesh is going to be destroyed, basically, be given to your sin. And then he says here that uh, the mention of the day of the Lord Jesus is as in passing, but this is something that's pretty important. This is, okay, that uh, spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Now, a question. He's addressing the fact that this is somebody that's a member of the church, so they would be assumed that this is a believer. Okay. So, when he stands before Christ, they want to... Why does he mention about being saved in that day? <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. If they give him over to Satan because he's not repentant, he would still be saved on the day of the Lord because he's a believer? Is that what you're saying? Like, what? For, okay, if he's given over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so he's, he dies. But would he have died unrepentant and still be saved spiritually in the day of the Lord? And if that's the case, if repentance wasn't necessary, why would he be given up to Satan anyway? He's still going to die eventually. We all we all die. Yes. Um, so nobody unless unless Christ returns. Okay. So unless Christ returns, we're all we're all we all have an appointment with that. Uh, He's addressing the fact, basically, that you have a short amount of time to be able to live for God. Okay. Now, I could be mistaken. My, maybe my grammar on here. My analysis of the grammar is messed up. If I am, correct me. But he's addressing the fact that, like, because you have a short amount of time to live, okay, uh, and you only have a certain amount of time as far as to live for Christ, that means you only have a certain amount of time to be able to go ahead and accrue rewards for him. Okay, what he has earned, or I guess what he has lived for, uh, I don't actually know the, you know, because I don't, I, I can't, I don't know your heart, I don't know this person's heart, I don't know that person's heart, I only know, you know, my heart before God. But if he had lived for God for a, a certain amount of time, uh, what he has, then he has, but whatever he has left of his time, uh, he should not live for the flesh because then it just comes wasteful. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if basically, okay, it's kind of like a mercy killing in a sense. Well, killed earlier than his time. Well, he wants him to be rescued from being ashamed before God. Mm -hmm. is, is, okay, that's, I guess that, that's, that's my conclusion on it. Um, if I'm going to be living wild and repentant, now that could be either blatant in your face sin, or as you know we would call it a secret sin. But the fact is, if I'm living in sin, okay, when I'm I'm not in fellowship with the Lord, so I'm not obviously being guided by Him, and I'm not going to be uh, rewarded for my works because I'm not actually working for Him at that point. Um, but I'll so when I stand before Him whatever time period that would have been. <coughs> so yeah, say, I'm, say I'm allotted 50 years in life, okay? Say I'm allotted 50 years, uh, 42, so I have eight years left, okay? Um, if I spend the rest of my eight years uh, just living for myself, living for the world, living for, for Satan, then uh, if you, if for whatever reason I just go wild, and then you guys end up having the churches for me. Okay, so I'm giving over to the destruction of the flesh. Um, Does that mean the person's killed? Is, is this person killed in this case? No. No. Because he addresses that in 2 Corinthians. Oh, okay. He's just, they're just saying, like, rather than just coddle him, you need to rebuke they him. They deal with it. Yeah. Okay. God's, God's, per, God's, 
God's purpose and in, in discipline is one, and want the person to to repent to for restoration. God, God doesn't want to destroy. You know, He's not here to bring death. He's bring. He wants to give life and give it more abundantly, uh, even with His children. The fact is, um, we see it in Hebrews 11 that you know, whom He loveth, He chastises and scourges every son whom He receiveth. Uh, God's purpose is that He wants you to be restored. He wants you to be in fellowship. You know, but if you're in sin, then you need you need to be corrected. That needs to be addressed. I'm sorry, but so the destruction of the flesh is not allow Satan to just make them die early. The destruction of the flesh is destruction of living fleshly. No, it's actually you're given over. Like in other words, you're given. If you are being stubborn, then okay, fine, have it your way. Kind of like. Kind of, I guess, in a sense of the prodigal. Oh, okay. Like, okay, you, you're you're given over to that you feel the repercussions of fleshly living, you know. That now you sense. may you may die in that process, yeah. you know, and that and that's the case, and then you died in sin. You're not cast out of heaven. You're not you know your salvation isn't taken away. But then what happens is is that you know you die more than likely prematurely. You died uh, in a state where you're gonna have to stand before him ashamed. And what time, I guess this is what I was trying to reference, was the fact, okay, if I had eight years left to live for God, you know, and I wasted them, um, say I died uh, three years from now rather than full eight years, right? If, if that's what my allotted time is. I don't know what it is, but I'm just saying, for, for sake of illustration. So I, I, I die three years, so then I have... So okay, so I would have, I would have been spared four years of living fleshly. I was still would have forfeited full eight years of having, but I wouldn't have had the additional four years of of gathering, you know, shameful things. I guess so that is, would be burned. So is it saying sin destroys, and you're given over to the sin that will destroy you? Maybe not that particular sin. You're given over to Satan to be. To have the sin, yeah, to basically to have, have those consequences of those sins that you're continuing in to yeah. bring about your physical destruction. Yes. The hopes is that you come to your senses and then, like the prodigal, you return and you repent, you know, because he wants to restore. Right, the saving in, I'm sorry, go ahead. The bottom line be, if he dies in that sin, he's not saved, he goes to hell. If he lives through that sin and repents and comes back to the Lord, then he would be saved. No, 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 no. Saved in the day of Christ. He's already born again, so we know he's not. So if a person dies in sin, it's not like, okay, God takes away their salvation. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's. You want to stand before God with having, some, having something to be able to give to him. He wants to spare you. He wants to rescue you from having to stand ashamed, either having if nothing. If a person is not ashamed, then they continue to live in that sin. And they know they're in disobedience. The church even tells them they're in disobedience, but they stay in that disobedience with the full knowledge that they're against God's will for their lives. Now, and they continue that way, and they die in that state. Where does that soul go? That soul goes to heaven. I know that seems crazy, but the fact is that soul goes to heaven because their eternal state was handled at the time that they were saved. Mm -hmm. S saved in the day of Christ is referencing now, since you are here at that future time whenever he raptures the church and then you have that seven year period of tribulation going on down here, we're going to have during that time. Um, now, I don't know if it'll take the full seven years to be able to go ahead and do this, but all believers that would have died in Christ are going to be judged not it's going to be the first Corinthians 3 judgment as far as you're going to stand before him either have your works be wood hay stubble or gold silver precious stone so he's trying to rescue you from having to stand before him ashamed wood hay stubble or have nothing is what that's okay let me I should just be to the point okay I'm sorry I'm trying to I just, okay just to be more that, that to the sounds point. very Calvinistic what's that to once they always say no. It, um, I, the only reason I would differ on that was because 
uh, for one, Calvinists presuppose that some people are elected to salvation. Yeah, it's th that's the only reason I would beg differ because they would they would argue, um, and then they would also argue the fact that if somebody would have been in sin to begin with or exhibited that that those whatever those characteristics as far as like they turn away, then they would say okay but they were never really born again. That's their answer. They were never saved to begin with. Yeah. Well, this person we're talking about would be he was he would have been saved but he would have been standing in shame. Yes. 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 Um, the two folks that I could think of as far as that would be dilemmas, I guess if you want to call it that, for somebody that would believe, okay, you can lose your salvation, would be Lot, for one, who the Bible calls righteous and a just man. In other words, he was a believer. He was born again. Okay, so Lot is in heaven, even though what we know of his life was waste. His early years, while he was with Abram before he left for Sodom, uh, before he turned his tent to Sodom and then went, went to go uh, live in Sodom, uh, he had a somewhat decent influence. Now, Abraham wasn't the best example, necessarily, but he was a good enough example uh, that you know, he's countless, countless times used in Scripture as somebody that, okay, you could look to that was faithful, even though he, he did a lot of really stupid things. Now, I mean, I'm not just referencing the fact as far as, okay, that he listened to his wife as far as going and, you know, sleeping with Hagar to, to bring him by the sea, but also the fact that he lied twice. Same, same scenario as far as the fact that, okay, this is my sister, not my wife. Uh, rather than trust God as far as out of fear, out of fleshly fear of the fact that, okay, when he was in Egypt, he thought that, uh, okay, or when he was with Abimelech as well, that he thought, okay, these, they're not, they don't have a fear of God, so they're going to kill me, so why don't you lie and then say that you're my sister. And then God actually comes and <laughs> uses those who he thought had no fear of God to rebuke him with regard to that. But um, anyways, and there was a few other things that he had. He didn't have um, maybe the greatest household, uh, even though he only had one kid. Um, but anyways, so a lot would be one. Um, and then you have also uh, Demas, who the Bible says, um, we don't have a whole lot on Demas, but we do say that he is counted with Paul as a co-worker, as a co-laborer, uh, and he was faithful to a point. And there was a point where Demas, it says that the, he loved the world, and you know he had forsaken it. Uh, but he never, it's never really inferred that, okay, he was, not a believer, just simply, okay, he just, he made a choice to say, okay, I'm going to pursue this. Now, we don't see any more beyond uh, what Paul had written to Timothy as far as regarding Demas, you know, that he had forsaken him, as far as whether he actually ever got right or not. We see that with John Mark, that John Mark did get right. Uh, he would be one, but, you know, we would say, okay, he died right. Uh, but anyways, those two would present, I, I think, would dilemmas as far as that people would want to argue with, with regard to that. Um, getting back to the day of Christ. Um, day of Christ is going to be the time where we're going to stand before God. Uh, go Philippians chapter 1, then to verses 6 and 10. He's mentioning, he's talking to them about his prayer for them, and then uh, verse 6, he says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, then you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then verse 10, he's praying for them also that their love would abound yet more and more, um, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Okay, so there's obviously a, a, a coming day that's mentioned here that specifically pertains to believers uh, and specifically believers within the church age and that is a day mentioned again in chapter uh, 3 of First Corinthians uh, that we've seen that is where Christ is going to be 
the one that's going to be judging, and that's going to be for our works and not, as with Day of the Lord, as mentioned, where the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat, and then God's going to rain down uh, judgment upon the wicked. All right, so practical application for us. Um, both are significant, both are important. Uh, we shouldn't confuse the two. Uh, and basically, Day of the Lord is something that we should be mindful of because of the fact that one, there are many unbelievers that are out there that don't know Christ yet. Uh, one, should they die without Christ, then obviously they're going to go to hell. Now, should we be taken up and they still remain living? Uh, and they're going to go into that time period in which you have, you know, Antichrist come up and then you're going to have God's going to rain down his wrath personally upon the earth and upon the uh, unbelievers bringing forth judgment, um, should they live to be able to enter into that? The fact is that's going to be a really terrible time. <laughs> and God doesn't want anybody to go through that. In other words, his desire, he's not willing that any should perish, but it all should come to repentance, okay? That's God's plan. Uh, and so that should be something that should be uh, our focus. Uh, now, Day of Christ also as well should be something that we should be mindful of. Uh, in particular, because that's more specific to us as believers. And so we ought to seek to live spiritual lives. We ought to seek to be holy in our conversation. Um, we ought to seek to have that which we do be something that would be not only just well-pleasing, but also that would be conforming to what we see in Scripture of, that would be glorifying God. Okay, we want to be able to stand before Him uh, and have, which, well, we know it's possible because it's mentioned. I just, <laughs> I can't relate to the fact, you know, as far as, okay, you have the Lord, this is God Almighty, you know, one, to even be standing, but and then just to stand, knowing, you know, how, well, I guess it's just because when we see him, we'll, you know, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is, so... By that point, maybe my mind will be changed some, but the thing is, it's like, I know what it was. <laughs> and I know I have been, I've not always been the most obedient uh, and most submitted uh, as, a, as a Christian. Uh, but the fact is, this, to not have any amount of shame or whatever, just to be his, where he can say, okay, well done. That should be our desire. That should be something that we should pursue. Um, next week, we are going to look at, uh, and not just for next week but for the next following weeks we're going to be looking at a series on faithfulness and commitment and just what scripture has to say about it and how it applies all right so we are dismissed um, Everybody? I mean, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.